Hi folks, welcome back to DeCarly Life. Thanks for watching. Today's episode will be about what to expect from a good quality discovery flight or introductory flight lesson. You may see seen one of these advertisements uh, usually around one of the holidays uh, on one of the couponing sites. Introductory flight lesson X dollars. Uh, give this to your dad for Father's Day, give it to your mom for Mother's Day, a Valentine's gift, etc. So this is going to be about uh, what to expect when you get to the facility, how much it's going to cost, we'll leave that to the very end, and uh, what kind of aircraft you're going, maybe flying, and what is really a good quality discovery flight, what does it entail. So let's get back to that in just a moment. Okay, there are three or four good elements that uh, comprise uh, a good introductory flight lesson or discovery flight. Now, understand this is not a sightseeing type flight. Uh, most flight schools are not geared up for that and it requires a special uh, authorization uh, format to fly strictly sightseeing flights or an air taxi license, which most flight schools do not have. So a discovery flight should be an actual bona fide flight lesson where you'll get some instruction on the ground, some preparation of what to expect during your flight, and actually hands-on control of the aircraft with an instructor by your side. And uh, you'll uh, depart the airport and uh, go into a, a practice area or area not too far from the airport and practice some basic flight maneuvers, straight and level flight, bank turns, simple, very routine things. Nothing out of the ordinary, nothing that was meant to scare you like acrobatic flight or anything like that. If that's what they're suggesting, this is not the thing for you. That's a separate course in itself. But an introductory flight lesson should be pretty uh, straightforward, fairly simple, easy to understand, and lots of fun. And uh, Usually the airplanes you're going to be flying uh, can hold up to four people. It doesn't mean that they can fly four people all together at the same time because small aircraft are very dependent upon the altitude of the aircraft, the airfield, the temperature and humidity, and the weight of the, each individual passenger and the uh, ability of the aircraft to uh, perform under those conditions. So the um, aircraft that you may be flying can hold up to four people but uh, based upon those conditions may be only to carry two or three depending upon those factors fuel load temperature humidity and uh, elevation of the airfield so be prepared if you want to have multiple family members participate in this with you you may have to get two aircraft to make that happen based upon certain conditions that I just mentioned um, the Questions you should ask before you uh, secure the coupon or make arrangements for this is how much actual flight time will you be getting? A lot of these companies advertise very low rates and basically they're going to say once you get there, well, you're paying for the time of the prop turning. Um, and you can spend on a weekend at a busy air airport 30 minutes on the ground just taxiing to getting ready to take off so that's 30 minutes already burnt fuel and, and time and then you basically be able just to go up and around the airport and back down uh, and that that is a fit, certain fee that some people are very comfortable with uh, what I'm not talking about that but I'm going to tell you the different options of what they cost and again the cost will be at the end but a real good lesson should entail one hour of time on the ground discussing with you the basic elements of aerodynamics, uh, the four elements of flight, lift, drag, weight, and thrust. Uh, how does an airplane actually fly? What are the basic components of the airplane? And sometimes some locations do that in a short, brief, three-minute uh, video. It's a, uh, like an educational video that you can watch. And while they're doing that, they're gathering your information uh, about you, such as uh, you'll have to bring with you, by the way, uh, a form of identification for each person flying. So would that be a driver's license or a, a photo ID or, or, or a passport of something of that nature. And you will uh, get that 
squared away once you come to the flight school and they will uh, let you watch this video uh, introduction about aerodynamics, basic elements of flight and what the airplane consists of while they're taking care of your paperwork and while they're you know, remedying your payment and getting your receipt ready. Now, if it's a real flight school and it's going to, you're going to get one hour of lesson on the ground, one hour in the air, it is loggable time. What does that mean? So if you should want to continue with this after you've had your introductory flight lesson, and uh, you want to pursue some, uh, you know, lessons to get a, a, your first sit license, which may, would be a private pilot license in most cases. Um, you'll have to purchase a log book at the flight school, which costs about five to seven dollars. And the instructor will log the time that he spent with you and what you did during your attendance there that day. One hour of ground instruction, what you discussed, uh, and one, how much time you spent in the air. And that will be noted in the logbook. And the beauty about that is logbook time never expires. Okay, it's good even if you don't decide to take lessons that following immediately following that this. Uh, if you want to start five years from now, that one hour of time is still loggable time. And uh, at the conclusion of your less, uh, lesson, when you return back from the flying and you get back into the uh, flight school again, they're going to spend uh, 15 minutes debriefing you, talk to you about what your thoughts were, how did you like it, uh, and then they can go into some discussion with you about uh, answering any questions you may have. And of course, if you want to pursue additional lessons, what does that entail? What are the FAA requirements to get uh, the, the first rating you want to pursue, a private pilot license or a sport pilot license? All of those details will be discussed at the conclusion of the lesson in most cases. And uh, so let's talk about the uh, different types of aircraft you may be flying. Most common aircraft at most flight schools of one or two type and or both, but it's not the only type. The most common one is this type of airplane right here, which is a Piper Cherokee or Piper Warrior. It's a four passenger aircraft. It is propeller driven, engine up front, non-retractable gear, meaning the landing gear always stay down, and it has a fixed wing at the, on the bottom part of the airplane. The other type of aircraft you may be flying will, will be manufactured by a company called Cessna, and most of their aircraft are high-wing airplanes, uh, engine in the front, fixed landing gear again, and these are the two options that you'll most likely encounter when you go for your introductory or discovery flight. Um, this is not a discovery flight about flying a rotary craft air, uh, uh, such as helicopters, and it is uh, strictly about flying in a, an airplane. And so the four elements of flight will be discussed, the type of aircraft, what you'll be doing inside this plane, and uh, then we will talk about, or what will be discussed most likely is, where will you be flying? And uh, we'll go over that in a moment. And what is the airport you're at? What, how is it oriented? What are the things that you will notice when you get into the airplane and you start taxiing? And what the different terminologies mean? Who will be speaking to air traffic control? And, uh, and what you'll be wearing? Most likely, you will be wearing a headset. So each person flying will be wearing one of these. It goes over your ears and the mouthpiece, the microphone, as you can see here, will be right up to your mouth. So they go over your ears and the microphone goes right up to your lips. And you can communicate and hear one another speaking at all times during the flight. And this helps drown out the aircraft noise of the engine and any other ambient noise. But you can certainly hear one another and you can hear the communication uh, between air traffic control and the instructor. Uh, in 99% of the cases, uh, you will not be speaking to air traffic control. That all the communications will be conducted by the instructor who will be taking you on the flight. And that's because it takes time and practice to gain understanding about the proper way to communicate and how to operate the, uh, the push to talk button. And so the elements are the different type of airplanes and uh, how many passengers they can sit 
and you'll discuss who's going to fly, who's going to go uh, in the back seat. Now, some locations do not permit uh, passengers, but you know most flight schools that I've been involved with and I've seen and operate, uh, if you want to bring a guest along with no additional fee, uh, they'll just be in the back and they'll observing and listening. And the, uh, however, if, if there are going to be other people that want to fly on the same uh, time, uh, you'll have to either come back to the airport, land the aircraft, stop the engine, exchange places with a different person. It's not like an, uh, like an airliner where there's an aisle down the middle. You can get up in the middle of the flight and go down the aisle. These are fixed seats, fixed seat belt. You're not going to be able to move around the aircraft from your individual seat. So any other multiple people wanting to fly, the aircraft will have to land each time to, and shut down the engine totally. Everyone will disembark, switch seats, and then you, the other person can fly, and it'll be the same process starting all over again. Now, sometimes locations do that to, to make it interesting, and they'll depart the airport you're, leave, you're departing from, and they'll fly to another nearby airport, um, and they'll land there to do the exchange, and then you'll get to experience the land that each person gets to take off and landing in a different location. And uh, each time you do that, You'll, you'll, like I said, you'll go to either a different airport or you'll return to the next air, the same airport you departed from. Uh, some better flight schools like to go to three or four different destinations to make that happen, depending on how many passengers want to fly. And uh, where do you sit in these aircraft? So the pilot in command will always sit in the left seat that's left on the front face facing out of the aircraft, and the instructor will sit on the right seat. The... Uh, Passengers will sit in the rear two seats, and there's a place in, uh, for everyone to plug the headset into, and the instructor will show you where to do that in the aircraft. Everyone will wear a seat belt. The two people up front will wear a shoulder harness as well, and uh, you'll uh, be very comfortable. There'll be plenty of viewing opportunities out the window, and the one thing that will come up is, uh, may I take a camera? May I video the flight? Well, uh, most flight schools will allow you to bring a camera and, and video. Uh, uh, flight, certain flight schools also will offer that as an option to you as an additional cost. They mount GoPro cameras in various places in the aircraft from different vantage points. And they, they, they're meant to either document your flight or watch you, watch, look out the window, look from the outside in, outside, inside out, etc and depending on, upon the sophistication of the video that uh, they have available to you. Now they do charge normally extra for that video because by the time when you come back, while you're being debriefed after the conclusion of your lesson, someone usually in the office is um, downloading that video from the camera and doing a simple edit and, uh, and uh, providing it to you as, when you depart in the form of a, a, an um, an electronic file that will be emailed to you and uh, that is very common and again if you want an edited version it, you're probably going to pay for it uh, and if you don't want that then you can certainly uh, in most cases bring your own video uh, equipment aboard or use your, uh, your, your cell phone and uh, just don't interfere with the uh, operation of the aircraft and the people. So uh, the ones that I've seen and been involved with when we mounted cameras in the aircraft are very professionally done. It leaves a very good result when you, when you get the file. It's usually viewable on any, any computer, any cell phone, and it's shareable on all social media. So you may want to consider that as an option, and it's certainly a memorable experience worthwhile documenting that way. So where will everyone sit again? So flying person... Uh, the guest flying person will be pilot command left seat, instructor right seat, passengers in the rear seat. The way you enter the aircraft will be explained to you in most cases, like on the Cessna, it has two doors, they open on either side. The rear passengers will get in first for convenience, and then on opposite sides of the, each part of the aircraft, the, uh, the flying person and then the uh, instructor will each respectively get in. In a Piper, it's only one way to get in the airplane. It's only one side entry. So you'll step on a step that walks the way you walk on the edge of the wing alongside the fuselage. The rear passengers will get in first 
and then the flying person will get in next and then the instructor gets in last and closes the door <clears throat> excuse me uh, there is uh, advantages and disadvantages to each kind of these aircraft low wing versus high wing and there's no debate about that right now they have been they've been in, manufactured for many many years uh, in the United States and their advantages to one or the other as far as the the um, functionality for an introductory lesson or taking flight lessons they're all, both adequate um, the, the high wing has an advantage that you can uh, uh, be protected by weather should it be raining and uh, the low wing is and, and that offers certain kind of visibility you can see out and down the piper low wing has other advantages it's uh, easy to see certain things above you uh, you don't have the wing in your, in your way, and uh, but less visibility necessarily to the ground. Uh, normally, uh, the the Piper tends to be a little easier to land, uh, but really it's common to have one of, or both of these aircraft at flight schools. They're very well designed. They're meant to be training aircraft, and they're also used for regular regular travel and. Uh, they're excellent, excellent aircraft. Been in production for many years with an excellent safety record. Uh, next thing you'll be talking about is uh, you'll probably will be uh, given a brief orientation of the airport and what are runways, where are they, what are taxiways, where are you actually located right now in relation to where you'll be uh, getting into the aircraft. Aircraft are usually parked in what they call ramp areas. It's not a slow piece of ground. It's just a terminology that's used to define where aircraft are kept. And uh, there are different ramp areas at, in, at different airports where aircraft are stored on the ground. And uh, you'll be shown that on a map of the airport where they're located, where you are currently in the airport as you sit when you're getting your briefing. And... Uh, how will you get from the airplane to the runway and what is that process about and what is the communication that's going to be involved to allow you to have that happen now some airports have control towers and there with uh, and there are other airports which are uncontrolled airports where there is no control tower there's no faa personnel going to communicate with you giving you the clearance to depart etc but there's different ways of doing that if you're at an uncontrolled airport uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a controlled airport scenario uh, where there will be a control tower. Well, you will be speaking to people in that control tower and uh, for various elements of your flight. Once you discuss the, uh, the airport diagram and where you're at and how you're going to be oriented, uh, there'll be a little conversation most likely about where will you be flying to. And if it's multiple passengers, uh, you'll be shown a map. It's called the terminal chart. It looks like this. It's not meant to confuse anyone. It's just to give you an orientation. This happens to be a, one of the sectional charts of the uh, New York, Long Island, general metropolitan area. And I used it many times to orient the person. Usually they're familiar with where Long Island is. Where the, I'll point out where the airport is that we're actually flying from where we might be going to, uh, if we have multiple passengers, we might fly over to, to Long Island Sound. I'll show them where the body of water is here on the map. I'll show them the other body of water, which is the Atlantic Ocean, and some of the major landmarks like New York City, Manhattan, <clears throat> excuse me, and other landmarks that they may be familiar with on the ground that they may have seen or if they live in the immediate area uh, and where they're located on this map here. I'll also point out where the other airport may be that we may be flying to if we do need to do a passenger exchange so the other person can fly. And, and if that won't be a, a, a passenger exchange, I'll usually tell, show the, uh, the individual where we may be flying to uh, to do the basic maneuvers that are included in the Discovery Fly. Usually most airports where there's training offered, there's some practice, designated practice areas uh, that the people depart to and fly around and to stay out of the normal traffic flow of the airport and the vicinity. In the New York area, this is a very busy area and it's an area we need to stay away from to allow jet traffic to come and go out of the major airports. That would be uh, JFK, LaGuardia, Newark, 
and uh, some of the minor airports like Islip MacArthur Airport, etc. But uh, that may be the case where you, you're flying. If you're in a dense metropolitan area, there are going to be many airports that may be in your vicinity that, you, that you know, you'll, you'll uh, be made aware of. And if you're out in the country, you may have a grass strip and you may have nobody to worry about. But uh, this is assuming the general uh, area like, uh, that you may find in most metropolitan areas where these types of discovery flights are most commonly conducted. And uh, so I would let you know that the instruction on the ground and uh, in the air will, uh, on the ground, most likely be, be given by the same instructor that you're going to fly with, but not always the case. There may be just a, a briefer on the ground that will go over these things with you. And then another individual, a certified flight instructor, will take you on the aircraft and, uh, and uh, give you your, your actual in-flight in, in lesson. So after reviewing these basics, and uh, there'll be some question and answer period, they're going to show you, uh, actually discuss with you, what are you going to manipulate in the aircraft, and uh, how, what, what's going to happen to the airplane when you do that. So the idea is for you not to get into the airplane and let the instructor do the flying. Uh, so once you get the briefing on the ground, um, we're going to discuss with you, uh, that you will be flying the aircraft from the time the engine starts to the time you uh, the, get clearance to taxi, take off, in flight, climbing, cruising, returning to the airport, and landing will all be done by the person who is uh, going to be in the left seat, the flying person, and with the guidance of the instructor. Now, the, these aircraft are all dual control, meaning there's Controls on the left seat in the front and controls, identical controls on the right seat in the front. So anytime you feel uncomfortable and you don't want to fly the aircraft or there's a concern about wind or a wind gust, the instructor can immediately get on the controls. No, no issue whatsoever with that. But the idea is to let you manipulate the controls from start to finish. And uh, the, the one control that you may have some assistance with are the rudder pedals. And that's a little unusual for people to get used to, particularly on the ground, uh, because the way you steer airplanes on the ground is with your feet on the rudder pedals, and they manipulate uh, this part of the aircraft called the rudder, and uh, that allows the airplane to turn on the ground. Sometimes it operates with a minor assistance, the nose wheel of the aircraft, sometimes it does not, but uh, most people are not that familiar. They're used to driving a car like this. Well, if you just do that in the airplane, all it's going to do is manipulate the ailerons, which are these little surfaces on the back of the wing, which turn you in flight. It will not do anything on the ground. So you can turn that wheel all you want on the ground. It's not going to make the airplane turn. You'll have to, and you'll be given some guidance on how to use these uh, pedals and on the floor in front of you, how to press left you'll go left, right, you'll go right. And where are the brakes on those pedals? Some, most of the time they're on the same pedals, you just tip your toes to the front and the airplane will stop uniformly. If you press one to the left, it'll stop the left wheel and you can turn on a dime pretty much with the uh, using of brakes. But again, that will be discussed with the, uh, the instructor and you. Uh, you will be given the opportunity uh, to taxi the aircraft. Now you're not going to be doing any of the communication like I said, but taxiing, I mean, what does that mean? It means taking the airplane plane from point A to point B on the ground. And uh, mo the taxiway has a, a yellow line down the center of it. And you'll be shown how, to, how do you keep the airplane on that yellow line without wandering. And you don't want it to go off that yellow line for a reason. It's meant there to keep you in the center of that pavement. That, to avoid obstacles, other aircraft, etc. And uh, the, the basic trick is uh, keep the yellow line on line with your, your, your right knee. Your right knee is in the center of the aircraft, basically, and that's where you want the yellow line to be. And you'll manipulate the pedals and you'll use them to steer the airplane on the ground as you're moving. If you're standing still and you press the rudder pedal, it's not going to do anything. You're going to just stay still. But the aircraft has to be moving. Airflow has to be over that surface, that rudder. And just like a fish or a rudder on a boat, you press the left, you turn left, you're going to go left. Right will go right. 
Um, the other thing is you cannot back up the plane. There's no reverse. So it's, uh, if, if there's some reason for you that you have to return this, you can't put the car in reverse. You can't put the airplane in reverse, like a car rather. So you'll have to do a 180 and go back, etc. But that, that, that's rarely happened. It, it happens on a flight. Um, but, uh, and there's times where it may be a little tricky to get out of the ramp area where there are other aircraft parked. So most likely if there is congestion there with a lot of other aircraft, which are not cheap, uh, and you don't want to hit them, of course, the instructor might just guide you out of the immediate ramp area where there are other airplane par airplanes parked uh, until you get onto the taxiway and then you'll continue from there. And once you uh, do the taxiing and you get clearance for departure, uh, he'll show you how to get onto the runway and uh, that uh, what's the uh, procedure for uh, getting to that point. There's a run-up area where you'll get the engine, you'll do some things on a checklist and uh, that's required and the, you'll give full power. You'll get up to a certain speed, he'll tell you rotate, you're going to pull gently back on the yoke and the yoke is, uh, why is it called the yoke? Well, it looks like an an upside like an oxen yoke like that if you turn it upside down you'll see it shortly on a simulator I have and that's where the word comes from it has nothing to do with eggs and yolk but uh, the yolk is what it's called sometimes it's referred to as the stick sometimes these aircraft like a piper or a cub has just a stick in the middle like a joystick but the, the two aircraft I'm talking about, the Piper Warrior, Piper Cherokee, the, the Cessna 172, 152, uh, 182, will have this type of yoke uh, in the aircraft on both sides, the left and the front of the airplane in the front seats. You're going to see a variety of instruments up front. Uh, they'll be going over with you, some basic instruments that you're going to see and keep reference to. Uh, most of the time, most aircraft have what they call steam gauges. These are round gauges in there, and uh, they are very traditional instruments. They me measure and monitor several things, your, how fast the engine is going, your airspeed, whether you're climbing or descending, whether you're banking left or right, uh, whether you're turning. Uh, these will be shown to you in the aircraft once you get there. There's many other instruments in the airplane that you're not going to really pay much attention to because it's too complex for an introductory lesson. Um, but the basic six pack, they call it six instruments, and they'll be you'll be shown what to look for out there and um, what they do in, in very brief terms. The uh, other thing you'll be most likely shown, and uh, if it's done the way it should be, is before you get to the airplane, even after you've completed this little introductory review of the geography, where you may be flying to, and uh, what landmarks you may be seeing out there, review of the airport diagram, you're going to be explain some things about what are the runway markings. What is a center line? And it's the same thing like on a taxiway. What do the numbers at the end of the runway mean? Uh, the number 24, the number 12. Well, those simply are the, uh, the magnetic headings that the runway is oriented to. So a uh, heading of, let's say, 24, a, a runway number of 24, it means it's heading, and you drop the zero, it's 240 degrees. It's aimed in a 240 degree direction. And of course, the opposite end of the runway is the reciprocal number of that. So those are the number runway numbers. You'll be given some guidance on uh, on uh, how to uh, manipulate the controls once you're airborne when pulling back and and on liftoff. And the airplane is not to be flown with a death grip. Uh, these airplane can be flown, airplanes can be flown with three fingers, so it's gentle, they're very easy to operate, they're smooth, they're comfortable, uh, there's no re reason for you to really grab this thing like, like a race car. It's not going to go like that. So three fingers on the control, you got a throttle lever, and you're going to push for power to increase the power, pull back to reduce the power, kind of like a gas pedal, but it's either going to be on the dashboard in front of you or on a control console. Forward thrust on the lever for power. Reverse, reduce power. Or a knob that you push into the console 
or the dash, forward for power, pull back for reduced power. Next we're going to uh, go over uh, some of the techniques for taking off and landing the aircraft. So let's assume this is the runway right here and we're going to use the Piper Wario or Piper Cherokee in this case. So for takeoff, you're going to have proceed on to the, the runway from the taxiway after you get clearance from uh, the air traffic controller and to do so. And there's three, two or three types of controllers in the uh, control tower that you may be speaking with. Uh, one is clearance delivery. They'll give you uh, the uh, permission to uh, uh, commence your flight from where you're going. Uh, to be parked to what you want to do, the practice area, the destination airport you want to go to. And then you'll get uh, be told to contact ground control. And these controllers are men and women. They're government employees. They do an excellent job uh, managing the traffic on the airport. And the ones in the tower manage the, air, the aircraft and the traffic on the ground and in the air in the immediate vicinity of the airport. The ground controller is responsible for all movement on the ground, not just aircraft, people, uh, maintenance vehicles, fuel trucks, everyone moving on the ground has a radio in the vehicle. They must communicate with ground control every time they want to move from point A to point B. You can imagine what a, 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 a chaos situation it would be if everyone just decided to move whenever they felt like it. There'd be intercessions with um, different aircraft with other vehicles. So the ground controller is like the policeman in the control tower monitoring and keeping everyone safe and properly distant and separated from one another on the ground uh, at the airport. The air traffic controller, however, is not involved with ground control. The air traffic controller is responsible for departing traffic and arriving traffic, air traffic that's transitioning the space over the airport, and air traffic that's approaching to land. That's the responsibility of the air traffic controller. Some control towers, if they're very busy airport, airports, have different air traffic controllers control, viewing different segments of the sky, different parts of the airport traffic. Other controllers are, are uh, there, sometimes there's multiple ground controllers handling different parts of the airport. And uh, there's another uh, type of controller, but it does not sit in the airport control tower. It sits at some center, usually remote from the airport, and that's a, uh, an approach, a departure controller, or in route controller, and they monitor your flight once you depart the airport and you're out of the airport, airport area. And they handle segments of the sky and they pass you off from one controller to another as you move around the country or different parts of the country and all the way all, all over to Europe and back and all around the world. So there are these all kinds of controllers around in different centers that uh, you'll be in contact with. Some locations, uh, there are uh, sparsely populated areas, there is no uh, controller in the area, so there won't be any communication. But we're assuming now you're going to be in a metropolitan area, somewhat dense, and you'll be speaking with someone in the control tower. So uh, you'll get clearance to taxi, and they'll tell you when and where and how, and before you even do that, before after you start the engine, you're going to listen to this thing called ATIS. It's the terminal information about uh, certain elements uh, germane to that particular airport. The wind speed, the wind direction, the temperature, the humidity deep dew point, uh, any things that may be of interest to a, a, an aviator at the airport, obstacles, things that may be out of service, uh, things that you should be aware of, birds in the vicinity, uh, there's uh, going to be parachuting that day, things like that will be on this announcement and it's every hour on the hour, it's, it's recorded by a controller and it's usually based on some weather station data that's provided at the airport or nearby the airport 
and uh, they will announce that it usually begins with a hyphenated letter information alpha and it goes through the whole alphabet every hour changes and then it'll be information bravo information charlie c information delta d so every hour this information gets updated and you'll listen to that first it also will tell you the act of recommended runway for departure and arrivals so uh, that's a recorded announcement you'll listen to that uh, once you enter the aircraft and everyone's belted in engine is on and uh, you'll uh, tune the radio to uh, the the uh, instructor will tune the radio to that particular station for that airport and listen to that recorded announcement he'll take down some notes uh, that he'll need in order to uh, make sure that everything is set right on the controls and that you're going to you're going to have some familiarity where you're going to depart from it'll announce the departing recommended runway and uh, then once that information is uh, gathered You'll speak to ground control. You'll tell them where you're at. I am um, uh, uh, Cherokee uh, uh, Three Alpha Victor, and that's the name number on the side of the airplane. It's like your license plate number, so that they can identify you. And uh, I'm at ramp area A. I want to depart to the active runway. I have information, Charlie and I'd like to depart the area to the southwest or I'd like to whatever you want your intentions are and they will give you specific instructions on how to depart the ramp area to go from that area to where you, the active runway is follow taxiway Bravo make a left on taxiway uh, Charlie uh, crossover runway 3232 two, whatever the instructions are they're going to give you a set of directions instructions on directions on how to get from the ramp area where you park to the active runway that you want to depart to you'll maneuver the airplane down the taxiway yellow line right me using your rudder pedals not this uh, because that won't work as we discussed and uh, you'll get to a, a run-up area you'll do some things on the checklist which I should show you. So you're mandated to use a checklist. The FAA requires it. It's in every aircraft that's unique to that particular aircraft. The, the checklist for the Piper uh, Cherokee is different than the checklist for the, the Cessna 152, 172, 182. Uh, so each aircraft has a different checklist. It's developed by the manufacturer of the airplane. It goes through a variety of steps that you must complete from the time you uh, even before you get into the airplane, uh, you're going to do a pre-flight. That'll be done usually before you arrive there by the instructor, so there's not a lot of amount of time wasted on that. Yeah, your time is spent more uh, on the briefing and more on the flying. But there is a pre-flight checklist that must be done. Certain things that are verified that are working and in order on the airplane before you even turn the key. And then there's a checklist of uh, a pre-taxi, before start, checklist, engine start, after start, the run-up, which is where you're going to go to after you taxi, the before takeoff ta checklist, then there's the after, ta after takeoff checklist, cruising, maneuvering, approaching, landing, and then parking checklist. Also on here are certain emergency procedures, if something should malfunction, what to do. So uh, that's all on the prescribed checklist. Uh, you'll be shown it. Uh, you may be asked to participate in it, uh, but that's really the responsibility of the pilot in command, although you will be the, the uh, pilot in command, so to speak. Uh, the instructor will be handling the checklist part of the, uh, the flight. So you'll do a, a, a checklist. You'll get you get to the run-up area, you'll verify some things on the engine that are correct, and then your frequency is going to change. So in the airplane there are radios, just like you have a radio at home where you can listen to Frank Sinatra or your favorite band or group. Uh, the difference between the radios in the airplane and not the radio you have at home or in your car is that this is a transmitting and receiving uh, radio or radios, meaning you can communicate with uh, the disc jockey, in this case the disc jockey or the DJ is the air traffic controller. And how do you do that? Well on that yoke that we talked about, uh, there's usually a little red button, it's the PPT button, press, press to talk, and uh, you'll press that button, it's usually by your right thumb. Normally you want to keep your thumb away from that because you don't want to press that talk, 
button while you're just conversationing in the airplane and the air traffic controller will hear and everyone that's on that frequency will hear what you're talking about. So uh, if you're going to talk about somebody, talk nicely. If you're going to accidentally press that button. But really keep that button, finger, that thumb away from the red button and uh, let the instructor do the communicating and he will press it to speak and release it when he wants to listen. And you'll hear that going on throughout and observe it going on throughout the flight. So once you've completed the runoff, he's going to change the frequency on the radios to a designated frequency at that airport to speak with the air traffic controller. And then he's going to tell them that he's ready to go, where you're located, we're on, uh, on the taxiway Alpha, we're at, on the east side of runway 12, ready for departure, and they'll, they'll give you clearance, you can uh, line up and wait, line up on the runway, do not you know, take off yet, or hold short, well why would you hold short of the runway? Well, you, there may be arriving or departing traffic that you have to wait till they uh, get clear and land or take off and are clear of the runway and it's, and it's safe. So at some point you will be given clearance to your approve for takeoff, you'll get on the runway and you'll line up with the, uh, the center line. Now the center line is a little different than the taxiway line, but it does round down the center of the runway. It's this dashed white line. These are the numbers we talked about before, and they reference, reference the uh, magnetic headway, heading that the runway is oriented to. And uh, you pass the threshold line here, that's the beginning of the runway. You park just after the numbers, and then you'll give it full power, thrust all the way forward, but not like, you know, when you're going to peel out and burn rubber in a car somewhere. This is slow and steady, forward, and everything is gentle and graceful in the airplane, uh, but authentic and real. So push it forward with deliberation, all the way forward, always keep hand on the control while your three fingers are on the yoke, right? Steady on the yoke, nice and level. And then you'll see the uh, gauges in the green. He's going to verify that certain things are operating correctly. Oil temperature, oil pressure, speed is coming up. Usually these aircraft take off at about 65 miles an hour or 60 knots approximately. And uh, that's when he'll ask you to pull back gently on the yoke. You'll pull back gently. No jerking movements, nothing abrupt. Pull back gently on the yoke. That's going to operate the tail here or the elevator of the aircraft. It's going to go up as you pull back. Push down, it goes the opposite direction. You're going to pull back gently. The airplane is going to depart very gracefully at a certain speed. And you're going to depart the airport traffic pattern. And what is the traffic pattern? The traffic pattern around the airport is basically two rectangular loops around the active runway for a part, parting and uh, departing and arriving traffic. And they have different names for different parts of those legs of the traffic pattern. And so you're going to want to exit that traffic pattern. And there's a way to do that at a certain altitude and you, how you depart. And you're going to fly off to the practice area or the other airport that we talked about earlier. Usually at a certain altitude. Now you're not going to fly on a short flight at 20, 30, 40,000 feet like you do in commercial airplanes. You're going to fly at a reasonable altitude, usually between uh, two to 5,000 feet. It gets you uh, high enough where, you know, the safety is a cushion. You're going to keep out of certain uh, other airport traffic areas and still have a very reasonable view of the ground and other landmarks you may want to see along the way. So the altitude, like I said, we're between two to 5,000 feet typically on these types of flights. And that's the altitude you'll be flying at. And what will you be doing? You'll be doing basic maneuvers. That doesn't mean you're going to be doing loops or these kind of barrel rolls. We're not doing that on, as part of a discovery flight. Or a matter of fact, you're not even going to do that as part of private airplane uh, training, private pilot training. That's aerobatic maneuvers. That's for a whole advanced level of flying that is not, you know, this is not what that's about. So gentle movements. Climbing, basic climbs, basic descents, very simple and gentle turns, nothing greatly, no steep turns, very simple flying. This is not meant to scare you, scare the passengers, it's meant to show you the agility, the nimbleness of these airplanes, how they easily they are able to be controlled, how easy they are to fly, climbing up, climbing down, turning right and left, 
and how all that happens in the three-dimensional space that we live in, which is a beautiful thing because on the ground we only have two-dimensional control. We can only go on the x or the y axis, and here we are on the x, y, and the z axis, which is a beautiful thing. You can go into three different in the three dimensions of space, which is a really fun, fun thing to do in an airplane. And uh, we have limited ability to do that on the ground because we can only jump so high. So, but in an airplane, you can definitely go in three dimensions really nicely and, uh, and have a nice time of it and see beautiful things. Your vantage point is totally different up there. You've, most of people have been in an airplane, but the, the vantage point is so high when you're on an airliner that you see great distances and great vantage points, but you don't see any detail. On these aircraft, you're flying at a, at a height where you have a, an opportunity to look out the window and I certainly encourage you to do so. It, uh, but, and also look out for other aircraft that are in the area. Uh, when you're flying on a, in an airline, your opportunity to see and look around is somewhat limited because your approach uh, is, is short in an airline. It's about a 15 minute approach, so you're only in close proximity to the ground on you know, takeoff and landing. Here you're going to be flying at the three, you know, two, two to 5,000 foot altitude, so you're going to have a lot of opportunity to see beautiful things out in the landscape, and it is a wonderful planet we live on, and enjoy the view out there while you're doing this flight. It's certainly uh, one of the benefits of flying, that you get to see the world from a different point of view, uh, bird's eye view, basically. Uh, so the, that's the, uh, how you'll get out of the traffic pattern. Next, you'll uh, you go to the, after you complete some basic maneuvers, you'll have to want to come back home again or go to another airport to land and do the exchange of passengers I mentioned. Uh, but let's say you want to come back and because uh, you, you have to get back, you have to return, you got to go home and, and do whatever you don't normally do. Uh, so we have to get back to home base. And how do we do that? Well, you just don't come in and land the airplane without permission. You got to get, again, ask for permission. How do you get into the airport? You're going to contact uh, the disc jockey or the air traffic controller in the control tower. You're going to ask, tell them where you're at, what altitude you're at, what your intentions are. You want to come back to land where you're I'm five miles out of this landmark or I'm three miles east of here. I want to come back with, to land. I have the information Charlie. And he'll give you some directions on how you approach the and where you should enter the traffic pattern. And basically, the instructor will guide you through that process. You'll, you'll do the flying, but he's going to tell you when to turn, where to turn, how to, much to go up, how much to descend. And normally, you come into what they call an air traffic, um, a uh, traffic pattern altitude, which is a designated altitude above the, the elevation of the airport that they want all the aircraft in that vicinity that are coming in for arrival, going to depart, uh, to stay at that altitude. Why? Because uh, it's it's easier to see any other airplanes in that area if you're all on the same horizontal visual plane. If everyone's at different altitudes, you'd be looking all over the place and watching for other airplanes. So if, as long as everyone's on the same altitude, the traffic pattern altitude, he'll ask you to say, all right, you're number two, follow the Cherokee in front of you, follow the Cessna ahead of you, you're number two to land. You don't have to look up, down, you just look horizontally, scan for that airplane. It makes it much easier. So you'll get into the traffic pattern altitude, and then you're going to fly one of these legs, one of these rectangular portions of the, or multiple portions of them, to come in for a landing. Now, how do you actually land one of these planes? Well, it's not difficult at all. Um, some airports uh, have uh, assisted uh, systems to help you land visual cues. Um, one is, uh, first of all, I should mention all airports take off and land into the wind and that's uh, basically why the or orientation of the runways are the way they are. You see they have these odd angular things. Well, orientations. Well, they're not arbitrary. Uh, before an airport is even designed and built, they do wind studies there over a long period of time to determine where the prevailing winds are coming from. And you want to the purpose of that is you want to orient the runway in the direction of the most prevailing winds uh, at that particular location because that's what you need for lift to get up. You need to go into the wind. So uh, the orientation of the runways at airports are generally because of where the, air, the uh, wind is oriented and, and comes most of the time at that location. 
So you'll come into her and approach the land, uh, into the wind, and uh, let's say you want you told to land on runway two four, as in the case here. So those big numbers are pretty easy to see over the uh, over the uh, from the sky rather, and from the window. And uh, normally you want to do this is the, the going to be the routine here. You're going to fly a beam. And once you're beam these numbers, where there you can look out your left side, you're going to see the numbers out the left side down here, the number two four. And that's where you're going to uh, basically uh, start your, your approach. So you're going to fly this way a little bit. You're going to make a left turn. If it's left traffic, if it's right traffic, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to make a right turn depending upon the traffic pattern in the airport that's active that time. And you're going to make a series of turns. Now, you're about anywhere from five to three to two miles away from the airport runway at this time. Now, you can see them uh, on a clear day, you know, sometimes 10 miles away, but it's got to be pretty clear. But usually within three to five miles, you can see the runway, you can see the airport, you can start to see the numbers. And you're going to, uh, unless you do something, you, you can just gonna keep on flying. So you have to do something to get the airplane down. One is you're going to reduce the power, and that's going to happen. And by reducing the power, you're going to start to descend. The other thing the, uh, the uh, instructor is going to have you do is extend the flaps. The flaps on the back portion of the wing, usually here, and uh, they uh, help improve lift. Now, how do they do that? Well, if you know anything about, uh, and you may have gotten this from the introductory video that they may show you if they don't have a video they'll explain it to you that there's something called Bernoulli's principle where air flying over an airfoil or a curved shirt surface on the top and the bottom is flat has a different speed it flies it flows faster and that produces negative pressure and you have lift <clears throat> it's a basic aerodynamical principle when you extend the flaps, it creates more surface area and again, more lift. So you can, even though you're slowing the airplane down, you can maintain lift by extending the surface area or by adding flaps. So you're going to increase inf inc increments of flaps to maintain your uh, lift capabilities because you just don't want to drop like a rock out of the sky. And you can slow the airplane down slow enough to approach to land. Now what is slow enough to approach to land? Well, you basically almost landing at the same speed that you took off at, about 65 knots. And how do you actually get to the runway? Well, you're going to go through those series of steps and you're going to do a slow gradual descent and you're going to aim for something. What do you want to aim for? You want to aim for those numbers. That doesn't mean you're going to drive the airplane into the ground at the numbers. What you want to do is, aim, that's your aiming point, and he's going, the instructor's going to, or she will guide you, he or she will guide you to the, how to get at those numbers. If you're drifting to the right too much, to the left, they're going to help you get all in the center of the runway, and sometimes there's wind blowing, there'll be some minor correction to compensate for the wind, they'll tell you how to do that. This is not a detailed lesson about it, but they're going to show you, they may assist in that process, but you want to aim for those numbers. Now, when you're aiming for those numbers, that doesn't mean you're going to hit them, you don't want to do that, so you're going to approach them, and at a certain level, about 10 feet off the ground, you're going to level off the airplane, and you're going to fly in level flight a little bit. And then you're going to do something that is uh, counterintuitive. You want to reduce the power to idle or zero. If it's a low wind day, if there's some wind and there's some gusting, you might have to keep some power on the throttle. And again, the instructor will do all that, help you with that. But if assuming it's a very minimal wind day, you're going into the wind, you're going to reduce power to idle over the numbers. Now, if you don't do something at that point, at uh, over the numbers and you're about 10 feet off the ground and you reduce the power if you don't do anything else you just drop like a rock so you don't want that to happen so you're going to do something that's counterintuitive you want to start to try to fly the plane a little bit so you're going to pull back slowly on the yoke and pull back pull back and you're going to say something like this i don't want to land i don't want to land i don't want to land and well, what's going to happen is the airplane is going to basically stall onto the ground real wheels will land first and then the nose wheel will drop just by gravity. 
to, you don't have to force the, the nose wheel down and drive it into the ground. So that's basically how the landing will go. You're going to use the same principle again at that point. Now you're not controlling the airplane left and right with the yoke. As you did in the air, you're back to using your feet. So it's back to pedals. Keep that center line on your right knee. And you're going to tack and go down the runway till you bleed off enough air where you're slow. And then you're going to be told as, you pro, as you're on the runway, you know, where to depart, which left or right, or onto one of the taxiways. And then it's back to the old routine. Uh, stop talking to DJ number one, talk to DJ number two. Uh, you're done with air traffic control, now you're back to ground control. They're going to tell you how to get from that point off the runway back to that ramp or parking area where you were. And there'll be instructions on how to do that. You're going to do the same thing, follow that yellow center line, right knee, using your rudder pedals, and you're going to get back to the ramp area and then using your checklist, there's a shutdown procedure to shut down the airplane safely and properly and the uh, engine will be shut off, uh, you can take the headsets off and then everyone will exit the aircraft and return to the school and you'll have a debriefing and at that point you will um, have an opportunity to ask questions and they will explain to you what's involved in getting a license if you want to pursue that. You'll be given, they'll, they'll take the uh, video card out from the, uh, from the GoPro or whatever uh, video cameras they have in the aircraft. And they'll process that video while you're waiting and uh, doing some of the uh, question and answer about, you know, what just took place. What did you like about it? What, you know, what concerns you have? Uh, do you want to pursue uh, additional lessons? Things of that nature. Uh, any questions about air, you know, aircraft? Uh, some people ask these common questions. Well, how much does an airplane cost? Well, basically used about the cost of an SUV. Uh, what does it cost to maintain? How much does it cost to keep an airplane here? What does it cost to rent an airplane? How much do lessons cost? How long will it take me to get a certain le license? These are all very common questions. All will be answered thoroughly by the uh, personnel at that particular school and uh, will encourage you to want to, if you want to pursue uh, a lesson, uh, to go for another one and continue on with uh, what the process is to get your, uh, your first license, if that's something you choose to do. Um, so all that will be discussed with you on the debrief once you've completed your flight. Um, before you go, I should mention, you'll be given an opportunity to use the restroom uh, and I encourage everyone, and we, oh, when I did it, we encourage everyone to do that. There's no uh, uh, restroom on these aircraft like there is on an airliner, so you want to make sure that you uh, use the restroom before you depart. And if you land at another airport when you're switching passengers, good idea to take a little potty break, use the restroom, get comfortable again. Uh, also, helpful to bring uh, a small bottle of water with you if you get a little thirsty. And uh, I rec we recommend also bring a banana. If anyone is, has uh, some kind of motion sickness, sickness issue, bananas are helpful. Uh, and or you can get something at most of the common um, chain, uh, chain uh, pharmacies. There's a little wristband that puts a pressure point on your wrist here. It does alleviate any motion sickness. If that's something that you may be concerned about, so you might want to bring one of those with you. But certainly a banana is helpful and uh, good to use. So now the other thing that you will be may be shown and uh, be offered to you before you depart to the airplane for to actual fly is a little bit of simulator time. So there are flight simulators at most most flight schools where uh, instruction is given when uh, sometimes weather is not favorable for flying or for other circumstances that uh, lend itself for more efficient use of training time. Okay, so here you see the flight simulator that I mentioned earlier. And this is just a uh, non-approved, FAA-approved flight simulator for home use. But you may see this in some, uh, or equivalent of it, at some of the flight schools you'll be visiting for your discovery flight. 
this screen represents uh, position of the aircraft on the runway. You have the yoke here, which I mentioned earlier, and you see it moving in the uh, on the screen as well. And these are the uh, flight controls for power and uh, mixture. And there's another control here I'm not going to get into. But and then this is your six pack, your basic instruments, your airspeed indicator, how many speed in knots, kind of like a speedometer on a car. Your attitude indicator. It shows you where you are in reference to the horizon. This is the fake airplane, these orange cursor here, and uh, right there. Then you have your altimeter, which is your altitude above the ground there. Uh, these instruments are navigating instruments, you're not going to be using them, but this is your six pack right here. Your turn and bank coordinator, how you're banking the airplane left and right, and how you're doing it, coordinate, coordinating your turn, you're not going to get too much into that. This is your heading indicator, where you're actually going uh, uh, as far as the reference of the airplane to a, a heading on a compass. And then your vertical speed indicator, how many feet per minute you're ascending or how many feet per minute you're descending. And those are the basic instruments you'll be shown and what they do. I'll give a very brief demonstration here of you know, going down the runway, uh, taking off in some straight and level flight. And the idea behind this is just to show you, before you get into the aircraft, what to expect, how the controls work, and so that when you get in there, you get a little bit of a sense of it uh, ahead of time. So here you are on the runway. You've been cleared for departure. You're going to release the brakes. You're going to get full power. Okay, so we're going to give it full power. Gauges in the green, rotate at 60 knots. And then you, these are some of the changes you're going to see on the instruments here. Climbing out at 70 knots. You're at 200 feet elevation, climbing at well, we don't want to climb that fast, but you get the idea of what's happening here. Climbing at about 500 feet per minute. Got to stay on the runway heading. And if you wanted to look outside the window, these are things that you would see outside each side. And you want to level off. A certain altitude, see what's going on, turning, banking. Left and right. Climbing turns. You're going to be practicing some of these maneuvers. Reducing power. Coming back to the airport. Which you'll see Anyway, that's the simulator just to show you how the aircraft controls left and right on the yoke, down, push, pull up, reducing power, and uh, again, not uh, extreme movements, gentle movements, three fingers you're flying with, and the red button to communicate, you're not going to press that, push to talk, that will be done by the instructor, but these are basic controls that you're going to see in the airplane. There's your six-pack instruments, as you which I mentioned earlier. These are your radios. That'll all be handled by the instructor. So you'll be given some simulated time just to get the feel. Now, this is not 100% uh, exactly the way the airplane flies, but it gives you a, uh, a general feel of what the inputs are on the yoke, what the inputs are on the rudder pedals, which I'm not showing you right now in this uh, portion of the video. And... Uh, what the reaction is from the air, aircraft, from your inputs to uh, the various controls. It's a helpful tool and it gives you some opportunity to uh, you know, get familiar with what the controls are, what the instruments are doing as, before you get into the aircraft itself. And uh, that's the use of the simulator. So no doubt you'll be given some simulator time.
Okay, so I hope you enjoyed some of that simulated time. So now, uh, costs. Uh, some of the, and what to be aware of. Some of these uh, coupon companies and operators of uh, these flight schools try to lure you in with some very attractive low rate. Uh, we're going to uh, give you a, a discovery flight for $99. Well, let's talk about what it costs uh, in, a, in a flight school to uh, provide an instructor. Instructors earn about uh, $40 to $50 an hour. Um, the aircraft that you'll be flying, these type of aircraft, burn about 10 gallons, 8 to 10 gallons per hour of fuel and at about $6 a gallon. If you're going to burn 10 gallons, that's $60 just for the fuel. And then, uh, you know, uh, $40 for the instructor, that's $100 right there and you haven't left the ground. So $99 is uh, a lure to, to get you to the take the uh, coupon to make the appointment and when you get to the airport what are you told once you're there you've driven two hours out of your way to get there through traffic or whatever and uh, oh there's a $150 fuel surcharge fuel is not included oh the video is $75 oh and there's all these add-ons and you get kind of like very disturbed as I would be too because you didn't e either read the fine print where it's very fine on the coupon or you were uh, not made aware of these charges but when you called so beware of a couple things one what is included in the in the uh, in the the rate and uh, how much actual flying time will you be getting how much ground time will you be getting and this reminds me of an old saying I saw in someone's office one day Cheap meat ain't good, and good meat ain't cheap. Meaning that if you think you're going to be able to fly around for an hour in the air and get one hour of ground instruction for $99, that's not reasonable. Uh, the best they can do is get you in the airplane without a briefing, uh, take off, go around the airport once, it's going to be about a 15 minute flight and land and debrief you. It's not a, a, a real lesson, it's the, just to get you to sense what it is to go up and down in an airplane. And this should be much more than that, much more of an experience. It should be the elements which I covered earlier. Uh, some discussion or a brief video about aerodynamics. It should be a, um, an overview of, of what the airplane is and that you'll be flying, what are its characteristics, what's the nature of the, uh, of the place you'll be flying in, and what procedures you're going to follow, checklists, uh, airport map, its orientation, who you'll be speaking with, uh, landmarks, the aeronautical map, and uh, some simulator time, and actual flight time. And that, to be done right, is about one hour on the ground and one hour of real flying. And that, uh, it, at today's cost in 2020, is around, uh, let's say, $150 to $175 uh, per person. Now, if two people are flying, there's going to be more time spent in the air, so more fuel will be burned. So... You'll have to discuss that with the local operator, but if you think you're going to get all this for $99, you're being sold a, a, a you know, a, a, a improper bill of goods. So uh, it's not reasonable to expect uh, an operator to offer all that for $99. So don't be uh, lured into that. Uh, understand what you're getting for what amount of money. And... Uh, the reasonable cost would be at a minimum of $150 and as high as $200 uh, for this experience. And that's what you want to get away with as a good experience, not somebody who just takes you for a very quick uh, up and down round about the airport. So there's more to it than that and you won't, it'll be over before you realize it and you will not really have gained anything. Uh, so that's not what this is about, a real bona fide introductory discovery flight should have these elements some ground school time about one hour and about one hour in the air flying not 50 15 or 30 minutes spent on the ground taxiing and and 15 minutes flying one air hour of air time real air time flying and one hour on the ground 
and that's what I would consider to be a good discovery, good introductory flight. And then uh, you can review with them what uh, is, in, is or is not included. If it doesn't meet your expectations, call around. There, most airports have multiple flying schools there. Um, from my experience, this is not a, a, a tremendous money maker for the operator. The air, uh, operators offer this as an opportunity to possibly get a student to continue on with lessons. And from my experience, from maybe 50 flights, you may get two students out of those 50 discovery uh, flights that will, uh, you know, go on and continue with lessons, maybe. Um, it's a very low ratio. So it's a high investment that the, also the operator makes to get people to come and try flying. And uh, with the expectation that it's a very low uh, turnover rate in, 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 into a, an actual customer that's going to continue on and a client that will proceed with lessons. Um, aviation from a, a school point of view, it is a business, but it's not, um, it's not a get rich quick business. It's a business that people usually do and most of them that I've met do it because they love it. They love aviation. They love the opportunity to show people what it offers and there are many things that you can do once you do get your little license if that's something you want to pursue um, you can use these airplanes recreationally you take your family to many many destinations and i've traveled all over the united states with the small aircraft and others other types of aircraft and there's beautiful places to go that aren't as accessible uh uh, certainly by uh, conventional air, commercial air travel because some of the airports are just too small to handle uh, airline uh, planes. So small planes are wonderful places to go and there are beautiful parts of this country to see from the air at a different, uh, lower altitude and number one and, and also uh, there's beautiful backcountry flying out west, upstate uh, in, in some remote areas of New York even and uh, it's just a, a very nice uh, thing to do. Now from a practical standpoint, uh, it's also a, a very utilitarian uh, uh, thing if you have a small business and you have to go to multiple sites. You can cover a lot of turf in, uh, in one day uh, with a small aircraft, even one of these. So, and you don't have to go through all the security checkpoints that you would on uh, commercial air travel. Uh, just, you just get in and go. And that saves a lot of time. I, when I had a business, I used the aircraft uh, quite often. Uh, and uh, it saved me a lot of driving time. And I was very productive. So uh, you'll find that uh, a lot of small business owners that have multiple sites that they have to go to or destinations in one day, it's a very efficient use of your time. And it more than pays for itself. So uh, I encourage you to ask a lot of questions when you get to your uh, uh, school of choice for your discovery flight it should be an exciting wonderful time and you're going to definitely come back smiling and uh, it can lead to other things and if not you at least got an understanding of what it takes to uh, fly a plane what what aircraft and aviation is about what local flying is about and what these small things flying around our skies overhead uh, can do and I hope you at least uh, were a little bit more educated about the process, what to expect, what is considered good service, and how not to be deceived with improper uh, luring or improper advertising as to uh, what you think you may get and not get so you won't be disappointed. That's the objective, to get you a real good understanding of what your, your reasonable expectation is from a good look, good operator. And that's what this was all about. Uh, have any questions, feel free to email me. I'll be happy to answer anything that you have. There's only so much I can cover in this brief video as to, again, what is a good discovery flight or introductory flight lesson. And uh, also, if you like our videos, and uh, you want to see more of this content, we'd very much appreciate if you hit the subscribe and like button and it will help develop more content on our channel. I thank you. I bid you farewell. Safe skies, safe flying, safe driving, and stay healthy, folks, and God bless you.